everybody. Really nice to see you all. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the Refugee Support Society. I'm sure uh, for those of you who have been before, you probably remember, which is great. Um, we are the Student Society at the University of Gloucestershire. Um, and we're promoting a lot of awareness this year for refugee causes. And one of the best ways that we can do that is by sparking a lot of conversation, hence the series. Um, we're working really hard to promote advocacy for the cause as well and take a little bit of action where we can. Um, we've partnered very kindly with CWR this year and that's how the series sort of came into the fore. So thank you all very much for coming along and I'll pass over to Isabel to tell you a little bit about CWR. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Um, so I, I'm here from Cheltenham Welcomes Refugees and uh, just really excited that we've got this series going with Ellie's Refugee Support Society. Um, we've got some great speakers and I'm especially excited today to have Ian here. Um, we do organise other events. Um, you're very welcome to join our book group, for example. We meet every other month and Anna, who's on the call, leads it. We'll be reading Butterfly by Yusuf Madini next. So if you want to hear how someone went from being a refugee in Syria to competing in the Olympics, um, why don't you join us? It's, uh, it's informal and always good fun. Um, but yeah, we're here today to hear more from Ian. And so I get to hand back to Ellie. Okay, lovely. Um, so thank you, Isabel. Um, we'll introduce Ian now. Ian is the Chair of Charity Trustees at Gay Gloss, and he works to support refugees and asylum seekers in Gloucestershire. Um, there's lots of exciting things that he's going to talk about, so I won't take up too much more time. So over to you, Ian. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so th thanks to Isabel and Ellie for inviting me to talk about the work that we do um, with LGBT and Q plus asylum seekers in Gloucestershire. I'm going to read from my script because if I don't, um, I go off on tangents and then who knows where I'll end up. So um, I'm reading from the script. So um, it's nice to see you um, all this evening. Um, and um, what I'm going to do is sort of do a bit of a presentation and then open it up at the end for some uh, questions and answers. So as you know now, my name is Ian Vesti, and I'm going to share some of my experiences and some of my opinions. Um, I don't have a legal background, I'm just a volunteer uh, working for um, Gay Gloss, a local charity. Um, I'm passionate about LGBTQ rights. As a gay man, when I was young, it was illegal in my own country. I was illegal in my own country. It was illegal to love and have intimate relations with another man in the UK. I'm an out gay man and maybe were I born later, um, I would now have a different language and understanding to describe myself as gender fluid or non-binary as well as gay. Gay Gloss celebrated its 30th year in 2020. Um, 30 years ago it was a very different climate and times for LGBT people um, and in we had no internet, uh, no mobiles, you can imagine any of that, no internet, no mobiles. Um, if people wanted to call our helpline, they would, um, if they didn't have a phone uh, uh, and a secret phone, they could, um, they'd have to go down the road to the, the red phone box and, and call in uh, from there. Um, so no internet or mobile phones. We had dreadful media coverage and portrayals of our kind as well. Um, and wasn't it nice of Richard Moore, who is the current chief of the secret intelligence service MI6, to apologise recently for the ban on LGBT staff working for the service prior to 1991. We took lots of calls at our helpline in those early days from people working at GCHQ who lived in absolute fear 
um, of losing their jobs and being outed as gay men and women. As a registered charity, Gay Gloss offers a range of specialist services to support LGBTQ plus people in Gloucestershire and the surrounding area. <clears throat> we advance the education of the general public and inform and increase the understanding of statutory and non-statutory agencies, as well as other, as other organisations. And we're currently doing a great deal of work in schools and colleges, delivering training and sessions to both staff and pupils around equality and diversity. And even during the COVID lockdown, we keep getting asked to um, uh, talk to schools. And uh, hopefully when now we're all, um, the schools are unlocked, we'll be able to go back in there doing some good work. We also deliver sessions to colleges and secondary school pupils uh, in Gloucestershire as part of the PSHE and citizen curricula. So I've been a volunteer with Gay Gloss for nearly 30 years and have been deeply involved in the journey of many people who identify as LGBTQ and their families and friends. And as you heard earlier, I'm also uh, chair of our trustees. We run an LGBTQ plus youth group, a very successful youth group based in Gloucester for young people aged 14 to 18 years old. We also run a parents group for parents, carers, family members and friends of LGBTQ plus young people. But one of the other areas of the work that we do is with LGBT asylum seekers. And we take referrals from Garrus. And this really is what I've been asked to talk to you about this evening, that, that work that we do. And I thought I'd introduce the subject and then open it up to questions. So feel free to ask questions. Uh, if I don't know the answers, um, I'll try and find out and get back to you. Um, but I'd like to set the backstory to tonight and to say that um, here in the UK, we are fortunate that being LGB or T is no longer considered an illness or a mental health condition and no longer a crime. We are now protected by the law. It's taken a long time to get to uh, where we are and lots of us marched and campaigned over the last 50 years for our equality and rights. I know that it's not so all over the world and in many countries it's a criminal offence and in some it's still punishable by death. Um, Countries like Afghanistan, Brunei, Iran, Mauritania, Sudan, Nigeria, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Somalia, United Arab Emirates, although that might, might be a little bit questionable. Um, they all have a death sentence. In many other countries, it's socially unacceptable and often subject to local ostracization and punishable um, and punishment by local groups where the police will turn a blind eye to beatings and punishment meted out by family and others uh, in the community. One man, man I met told me that he was taken from the village into the bush by men directed by the village elders, badly beaten and tied to, the, to a tree and left to die. He was cut, cut free by a stranger in the middle of the night and left to fend for himself. It's not easy to claim asylum in the UK on the grounds of sexual orientation or transgender identity. You have to prove that you are LGB or T. The fear of coming out to complete strangers at the Home Office is considerable. Um, Many are traumatised by their treatment and experiences in their own country and many have an absolute fear of anyone in authority, particularly those wearing a uniform, um, such as our police or border force. Um, they often don't give a good account of themselves because they're so frightened and traumatised by their journey. Some will have travelled on long journeys to get to the UK and will be tired and exhausted being asked a lot of questions, sometimes through an interpreter, can be both frightening and harrowing. 
They say things they regret and sometimes don't say the really important things because they are too afraid to say them for fear of repercussions. They don't always have the language to describe their feelings either um, about who and what they are. And they don't know how the person interviewing them will react. Even interpreters can intimidate and sometimes put their own spin and opinions into the conversation. Um, one of the first um, people I dealt with claiming asylum had come from Iran. And um, <clears throat> during the course of his first interview, um, he, he had a, an interpreter, his English was not good. And the interpreter, as an aside, said to him, uh, you are a really bad Muslim um, for, for being gay, um, which sort of closed down the conversation straight away. It stopped him saying what he needed to say. Um, and just as, as a sort of personal experience, really, that when I was um, younger, <laughs> in 2004, before, before Poland joined the EU, I met a guy in Amsterdam whilst on holiday, and I invited him to come to the UK to live with me. He travelled on a coach through Europe, so far so good, and then he was stopped at Dover and pulled off the coach. He was questioned by the border force and asked why he was coming to the UK and who he was staying with, etc. He had a letter from me inviting him to come and live with me. They wanted to know how we met and why I had invited him. He told them all sorts of things, uh, all sorts of reasons, except the real one. Uh, he was so scared to say that he was gay and that that was the reason he was coming to live with me. We'd met in a gay bar in Amsterdam. So I was waiting for him at Victoria coach station and was about to leave thinking he was not going to turn up when I got a call from the border um, force asking me about this guy and how I met him and how I knew him, etc., trying to verify his story. I also tried to, um, tried every answer but the truth, really, because I didn't want to out him and I didn't want to get my friend in more trouble. I didn't want to drop him in it. Um, but eventually I hinted that we were more than just friends. The border staff guy said to me, oh, why didn't you say you're gay? We'll let him in then. He eventually turned up at the coach station and told me that he'd had a similar conversation with the member of staff off the record whilst they were outside having a smoke together. My point is that um, you just don't know how the person interviewing you is going to react. I spend my life as a gay man doing a risk assessment every time I meet a new person about should I tell them I'm gay or not. You just never know how people are going to react. So the Home Office is um, default position for those who are LGBT seeking asylum is often to say that they find their story not credible. So they are then faced with having to prove that they are gay or lesbian. And how do you prove you're gay? How do you prove you're straight? How do you prove you're heterosexual? How do you prove you're bi? Um, so put that together with the hostile environment created by, this is where I get a little bit political, Theresa May's Home Office when she was Home Secretary and its continuing legacy today and it makes for scary times for people um, seeking asylum because they're LGB or T. In fairness to the Home Office, um, they have learned a bit about us over the last few years. They've stopped asking for explicit pictures. They've stopped asking what we get up to in bed. And they've stopped asking or stopped looking for camp stereotypes. And that's that's been a, a subtle change in the early days when I started working with asylum seekers. Those were the sort of questions 
that they've been asked. Um, so they've stopped asking questions about who's the man and who's the woman in the relationship. They still ask, why don't you have a relationship? Why haven't you been out meeting other gays? How can you be gay when you've been married and have children? And if you're bisexual, why can't you just live a normal heterosexual life? Can't you just live under the radar in your country and not rock the boat? Um, and often asylum seekers, um, when they arrive in the UK, um, are just surviving here. Um, and they're often marginalised by their own communities as well. It's not acceptable in lots of communities here for people to be openly gay either. Um, I met a guy from the Cameroon um, who, who lived on the streets of London, living in empty shops and begging for food and help, unable to understand our systems and unable to access the support and understanding they need needed. Um, unable to speak English, unable to tell those he was with what he really wanted to claim asylum for, for being for fear of being outed. With no money and no accommodation, how would they find another gay person when they couldn't even buy a coffee? Survival being the most important thing on his mind. He said to me one night the police picked me up because I was so cold and took me to the police station. I slept in the police station uh, for the night and then the police contacted the Red Cross who contacted another organisation who contacted the Home Office for me. I then applied to the Home Office for accommodation. They sent me to Cardiff. And just as he formed a network of LGBT support in Cardiff, um, you know, he started to uh, find some friends and support. Without any notice at all, they sent him to Gloucester like the next day. Um, he he just settled in Gloucester and we found him local support and a network of friends when the Home Office sent him to Wakefield. And we've since lost touch with him. Um, it felt to us like a deliberate tactic of the Home Office to undermine his support network. Uh, it's not an uncommon story either. Um, for some people, their deeply held religious beliefs are very important to them. And many are in deep internal conflict trying to square their sexual orientation or gender and their religious beliefs and teaching. They have traveled all this way only to struggle to find true acceptance and a place where they can feel able to be openly out within their religious community in the UK, in Gloucester. We spend lots of time looking for local support for them. The don't ask, don't tell option is often felt the safer option, but this does not allow them to be themselves and to really get the emotional and spiritual support they need at a time in their life when they're desperately in need of it. This option means that they have to continue to lie about who and what they are. Being judged for how they were born and who they are is not what they need. Gay Gloss works with clients supporting them to find other LGBT support locally, um, taking them along to meetings and to meet other local LGBT people. We've even taken, we've even had some uh, volunteer for our, to work with our youth group and, and they've been a great, great, great contributors to, to our, our young people. Um, we offer them emotional support and an understanding of life in Gloucestershire and other parts of the UK um, for LGBT people. Going together to a gay pride is so liberating and life enhancing. I took one guy uh, with me to Bristol Pride a few years ago. He was unbelievably emotional. Um, he just couldn't believe that it was so acceptable to be out and proud as a gay person. Seeing same-sex couples walking hand in hand and kissing was so powerful. I get emotional now just thinking about it as well. It still moves me. 
remember I talked earlier, I said, mentioned earlier about um, uh, how do you prove that you are gay or lesbian? Um, the sort of formula that we came up very early in, in the days when I started working with um, asylum seekers was there's nothing more powerful than your gay story. So one of the things that I do is spend quite a bit of time with individuals just putting together their gay storyline or gay story. It's a very powerful way of establishing their gay credentials. And it goes quite a long way to answering how do you prove you're gay? Um, and we've had quite a bit of success using that method or tactic, um, countering the Home Office's position of proof that you're gay. Um, taking somebody back to their childhood and talking about when they first thought they might be different as a gay boy or a gay girl, um, it, it's a really powerful place to start. Um, and one of the ways that we gather their story is really just to go back in time, go back as far as we can uh, about if you like, their awakening of who and what they are, and then telling that story. Um, we also work with solicitors and barristers, helping them to understand how powerful their client's gay storyline can be. And so far, we've had pretty good success, um, almost 100% success with all the cases that we've dealt with over the years using um, their gay story, really. Um, I'll, I'll finish at that point um, and open it up to questions, if that's OK. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, really, really interesting and heartwarming and scary things to hear. Um, but we will open up for questions. So. Um, Isabel, is there a way we can see everybody on the screen again? Um, I've just got Ian as a big picture at the moment. I suddenly sprung as a big picture, was that? <laughs> yeah, that, that was on purpose. Uh, can I just uh, tell everyone, if you don't want to be in the recording on camera, um, please turn your camera off. Three, two, one. Okay, there you go. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so I'll try and take some questions. Um, if you can just pop your hand up, I'll <laughs> try and get around to you. Um, or oh, hi, Isabel. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll just um, use this as my chance. I mean, it was incredibly moving. Um, thank you for sharing all that. Um, I was wondering what it's like, are asylum seekers, are people seeking asylum housed in common accommodation? And what does that mean for them in, when they have shared accommodation in terms of how do they, yeah, well, yeah, I think that's my question. Um, well, there are, there are a number of sort of sides to that really, I guess. Currently it's very, I think it's very dangerous because they're living in a, in a house that the people I'm dealing with right now um, are living in a house with four or five other um, people sharing the kitchen and you know all the common spaces and given that we've got this you know COVID it's not a, not a safe place and they're very frightened um, a lot of them are very frightened they just sit in their rooms and, and don't go out um, and they're very cautious about sharing. The other thing is that um, uh, is about being outed within the house um, and uh, we have to go to um, have to be very careful we we don't out them um, uh, by mistake as well um, I, I, because of Covid I've not been able to you know go go in to meet people 
physically for quite a while, but I have to be very careful when I meet people physically and I go into Garras that, that I don't help them by my presence, if that makes sense. Um, um, I, I wouldn't say I'm a well-known homosexual, but I, I you know, I, I know people know <laughs> who I am and what I am. And if it's that bit about being gay by association. Um, so I had to be very careful that um, uh, I protect, the, you know, what I'm doing and the identity of the people I'm working with as well. Uh, is that, does that answer your question? Is that, is that what you were... Yes, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Thank you, Isabel. Um, Michelle, do you have a question? Thank you. Uh, yes, I do. Hi, everyone. Um, I just was curious to find out if your organization has any type of resources to support um, and perhaps do an assessment of people who may present with mental health issues or drug use issues, because I'm, I'm um, with you from the US. And one of the, the definite observations that, that we know exists within the community, sadly, is, you know, some, some definite um, challenges with drug use and mental health issues. And as a result of that, um, a lot of NGOs try to provide resources to support that. So I was just wondering, because definitely the, this particular population of wonderful people will be confronted by a lot of trauma. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we we have limited resources and uh, um, Garris, who um, you know we've worked very closely with on this, have, have more resources than we do to support support people. But uh, I'm well aware um, that most of the people I've worked with have um, mental health issues, um, often caused by the trauma that they had at home uh, when they were living in their own country and what happened to them. And they carry that trauma with them. Um, you know, if, if you've watched your gay lover being thrown off um, a high rise, you know, five story oh. building, the trauma is, you know, how do you, how'd you oh. get that out of your mind? How do you, you know, so a lot of them are very traumatized mm -hmm. and in a very bad place. Um, and I noticed that um, many of them, uh, as soon as they can uh, get into our health care, they, they will get um, medication for depression mm -hmm. and anxiety uh, and lots of other things. Uh, which which are indicators that they are really struggling with their mental well-being. Um, I mean, the the thing that the thing that we can do is is support them. I I met somebody new this week, and um, he he is such a changed person from the first time I met him, just because he was able to talk openly, if you like, to another gay man about his journey and his story and it's a very that's a very healing um you know that's very healing am i is that am i answering that question uh, michelle is that oh yes definitely thank you so very much and thanks for the great you know job that you're doing Ian, and your compassion because I work with um, people who identify as being immigrants, some of mm. them refugees, some of them um, who are not in the country legally. And it's, it's, it's very impactful, you know, yeah. their, 
their journey and their life experiences. So mm -hmm. thank you for being a humane reference to mitigate all that they go through. Thank you thank and your you. organization. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Michelle. Um, hi, Tristan. Okay. Thanks, Ian, for your talk. Um, I was sort of interested in, um, I guess it's the idea of being an ally. Um, and, you know, when you talked about um, pride marches and feeling that that's a way to sort of be an ally. You know, I've mm. been on, I was lucky enough to be in Italy working a couple of years ago and it was pride in Italy and managed and joined that and that was a great experience um, yeah. particularly in that sort of um, notion that that's a country where being gay is potentially not so accepted as um, in this country but thinking okay what on the other 364 days when there isn't a, a pride event to go to or you know I'm not doing the sort of work that you're doing how how can um, allies to the LGBT community and particularly uh, how can we sort of support or demonstrate our support, you know, that, that, that allyship? Oh, good one. Um, I don't know that I have an answer to that. I, I mean, allies are always great. And I've, I've always said right from, you know, 30 years ago and I, you know, was talking about, um, equality and things like that for us. Um, you know, uh, we wouldn't have got the legislation that's in place now without, you know, the bulk of the population wanting it to happen for us, you know, with without straight um, allies and partners. Um, we wouldn't we wouldn't have got there. You know, we need we need each other. Um, and supporting each other is is really, really important. Um, and, you know, supporting organizations like Garris and, and, and us for the work that we do is, is you know, is, is a good way to, is a good way to support. And normalizing who and what we are, whatever normal is, um, you know, I, I um, yeah, I, I mean, some of the, some of the ways that we integrate people into, you know, Gloucestershire, is that you know I take them along to an LGBT um, social group, um, you know, and enrol them as members, uh, and that's a really good way of starting to integrate them into the what you know the wider aspect of um, uh, Gloucestershire. It's still an LGBT organisation, but yeah, you, you know, I, it's a start, and and I hope people will then, you know. You know, feel like they, you know, belong in Gloucestershire and and can join other things. I know they go. You know, some of them uh, will want to play football or cricket or, you know, and so on. Um, you don't have to be. You know, it doesn't matter what you are to be playing football. <laughs> um, but, uh, I yeah. Um, is that answer? Is that an answer? It's a sort of part answer, isn't it? I'm struggling to answer that fully. I mean, uh, we haven't got an organisation which is, um, you know, got everybody in it. But uh, and it would be nice to get to that point point where it doesn't matter who and what you are to belong to, you know, any organisation really. Yeah, it's my dream. I mean, when if you think when I when I was. When I was a youngster, I, I never dreamt that we would ever be able to marry. It was way out of my thinking, you know, but here we are. We can and we do. Um, so things do change and, you know, and that's part of us, you know, being part of the mainstream, isn't it? And norm, norm, normality, whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Tristan. Ian, could I just add something, please? Mm. It's Emma from the partnership, but just yes. to sort for that question. I recognise you, Emma. Yeah. Hi, Ian. Yeah, thank you very much for tonight. I would say to anybody who wants to be an ally, because I sat for 40, 50 years being taken as a, a straight man, 
before I was diagnosed and transitioned. I'm, what, 59 this year. And I can remember after three years of transition, somebody walking up to me, and it was the oddest thing because there was like a double take when they met me in the eyes of, are you a danger? Are you anything to do? And they looked at me like a human being. Mm. And it was the first person apart from, say, somebody in a gender identity clinic or a specialist mm. who just gone, you're a human being. Mm. And, and I realised that for three years, nobody had. So I think we underestimate as allies because I sat as a very strong ally before I was diagnosed because I mm. hadn't worked mm. out my own gender identity. Yeah. And that bit's about just integrating them into the life in the office or the social or the club or the group and talking to them like exactly yeah. like everybody else. Yeah. And if for me as a lesbian, my partner comes up, I'll just talk about her. Mm. Or similarly with kind of gay guys I work with in the past, they just talk about their husband or their partner. Yes. And that bit's about having the conversations inclusion in exactly the same way we would for anybody else. Mm. And just going, you're human, but you have to be dating a girl, Em, or, you know, Ian, you're yeah. dating a guy. Yeah. Yeah. It is very powerful. So I'd say to people, please never underestimate that because that absolute acceptance of people as just another human being who's dating mm -hmm. somebody else is, mm -hmm. is often just a, an inordinately powerful way of making somebody mm -hmm. get all the signals about safety and inclusion because, yeah. because you have made them safe and they are included. So um, that will be my thought. Thanks for letting me speak, Ian. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And that was it's very you you know i support your point it's very powerful yeah thank you emma that's really helpful um ian there's a couple of questions in the chat if, if it's okay with everyone i'll just direct those yeah um anna's said you mentioned some sm small subtle positive changes in the approach of the home office what did you think had led to these changes and what are the next steps to push for to improve the situation further i think i think um um organizations like stonewall um have been very good at campaigning to get um um you know, to get to get changes in the way people are treated through the process. It's, it's a really complicated process. Um, how anybody ever navigates it if you don't have English and you, you know, and so on. I, you know, I'm in awe of people who navigate their way through these things. But, um, and, and, the, and the attitude, attitudinal changes have, have definitely, um, you know, as I say, uh, organizations like Stonewall, a migrant, um, a group called Migrant, oh, I can't remember now, um, not Migrant Legal, um, but there's another organization which does campaign and work with the Home Office to, to get them to change and they've been successful to some extent, yeah. Thank you. Um, I hope that helps, Anna. Just let us know. Um, I'll come back to your question, Michelle. Um, I've just got another one from Bill. And he said, I was very interested in Ian's reflection on the issues faced by people who have strong religious beliefs and the issues that it may cause, it, the issues it may, that may cause excuse me, and the issues it may cause them. In Ian's work, is he able to engage with local faith communities where there may be people who are welcoming and sympathetic to people who are LGBT? Do you have a process in place for this? Um, I don't know about a process, but I, I've done quite a bit of work um, looking for um, uh, Christian organisations and, and churches that are um, supportive of LGBT people. Um, and some of the inclusive churches are, are quite good at, at welcoming LGBT people. I think the problem comes when of not knowing how the rest of the congregation are going to uh, accept you. Um, and that's, that's that bit about that risk risk factor um we we had 
one church a while ago emailed us to say that they were very welcoming of LGBT people. So we sent two, two people in on a Sunday to check it out. And um, it was not good at all from the pulpit. They were preaching, I wouldn't say it was hate, but they were preaching that uh, being gay is not um, not acceptable. Um, it, it, you know, finding the right place. I, I did find some, you know, I, I haven't got them to, to hand at the moment, um, but I have found uh, a couple of places. And if, if somebody's uh, looking for a, church then I can point them in that direction and they are very welcomed and, and looked after. Um, I haven't found a mosque yet that will welcome LGBT people uh, and it would be nice to find a mosque who would who would do that. There's quite a few people I deal with are Muslim and uh, not being able to practice their faith is really 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 difficult for them and they, you know they they've left a country that is really really homophobic and dangerous hoping to come to a country that is you know has got all the protections we need legally and so on and what and you know welcoming only to find that it's not not quite so there's still some work to do i think on some of those um you know, some of, some of those areas, really. Thank you very much. Um, Bill's just got his hand up as well, just, I think, to come back to that, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello, Ian. Oh, hi, Bill. Hi, pleased to meet you. It's a real privilege to meet you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for everything you've said tonight. Um, I'm a member of CWR and I lead the faith group and I perfectly understand what you've said tonight of people who may have um, strong religious beliefs and feel in a very difficult position. I'd like to offer my friendship to you and my contact to help you in any way you wish. I'm a member of the local Catholic community and I'm quite happy to help you as a member of that community and help people who you are in touch with. We have Muslims within our group and others, and I'm quite happy to extend an arm of friendship from you to them and from them to you and look at ways in which we can help you. I'm quite happy for you to have my details either from Ellie or Isabel or direct to me. Great, that, that's really I, great, yeah. I would also say, Ian, that I have a brother who's gay, and I was very pleased to go to his wedding in Sydney two years ago. It was a great celebration and a great witness of love between two people and a group of people. I encourage you in any way I can to do everything you can to help those who come to you. God bless you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Bill, that's really lovely. Um, just as an aside to that, um, Simon's popped in the chat that the uni chaplaincy um, is very welcoming and Pip and Jim's in Cheltenham. Um, I'm sure we can give you Simon's details as well if he's comfortable with that. I don't want to extend that unless you already know him, of course. No, I um, don't. But any, any of this information, if you can send it to me, is really great. Um, I'm always looking for you know, safe, safe spaces and safe places for people to uh, to be themselves. Um, and that would be really, really great. I'm particularly interested in, um, is it, um, the question, I think that for Simon, do you think Atik might know of a mosque that would be welcoming? Um, I really, I really like to find a, a mosque that is welcoming. Um, um, I'm sure we can help you with that. Um, Teek is one of the imams at the University Chaplaincy. Right, right. Um, and Joe Parkin is with us today. Um, so yeah. I can, if 
Joe's comfortable, I can set up a meeting between you. And um, can I just say, it's really lovely that this conversation has happened. Um, the nature of this series is to draw people together and to get action to mm. happen mm. in a really positive space. So thank you, everybody. It's really, really great. Um, it, honestly, it's warmed my heart. It's really special. So thank you. Um, I'm just trying to see if there are any other questions in the chat at all. Um, I, I think you can't see uh, that Mich Simon has his head, hand up. Ellie? Oh, I'm so sorry, Simon. Yes, please take take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Now I was just and and and, and uh, Isabel. Now I was just going to say thank you so much for Ian for sharing, uh, and and it's been really really helpful, and and uh, you know moving to hear what you've had to say, and uh, you know I I recognise as a Christian how slow the journey has been for a lot of churches, um, and how frustrating that is for some of us, and it certainly is for me. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think it is, you know, it isn't easy for some faith groups. So the Atik is, is, is the colleague of myself and Joe, and certainly I think the best thing with Atik is, is to, for us to have a chat with him and then get back to you. That may be the best thing to, yeah. to, to do that. That would be certainly. But, uh, but um, yes, uh, I know that sadly there are churches which want to say that they're, they're accepting, but they accept people on their terms. Well. And, it's not My fully experience is, is, is it's 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 like we accept everybody but you because <laughs> yeah, always, yeah there's always a but and as, yeah. a gay, as a gay man I felt that I've always been one of those buts yes. for for many years yeah. um yeah and it it you know and we're, we're going I'm going off on one here but until until the churches accept that that part of the Bible's teaching is wrong then there's always going yeah. to be a but you're yeah. always going to be able to um, fall back on that <clears throat> that yeah. but leviticus says or yes. whatever yeah. 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 absolutely and yeah. uh, in, it need, you know in need, we need to get to the point where it um uh treating lgbt people um uh you know uh, as you know, the you know ord ordinary human beings like the rest of us, and not treating them uh, in that way. You know that we we managed to get you managed to ignore the bit about slavery. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so, tell, tell me about it. <laughs> well, why, why, why not? Why not me? Why not? Why 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 not me? You know. Um, I, what, what I would say is that it's interesting. I, um, uh, my best friend is in Scotland. who's gay and and. and and very involved in the church up there. The Scottish church has moved, as some of the English churches have, a lot further. So it just yeah. shows it's not, it's not a necessary thing. It's just that uh, people say uh, the Church of England's got a got the motor of a lawnmower and the brakes of a juggernaut, and that is rather the way it is. So um, yeah. at the moment, we're in a process um, which yeah. is going to be over the next couple of years, which is which feels like it's gone on for about fifty years. But you know, it's it's finally getting somewhere yeah. um, and I just I just feel very ashamed really of the speed of that pro process but I really hope that in in not many years to come we'll be able to celebrate um, uh, weddings uh, 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 between uh, gay men lesbian women in our churches very yeah. soon but you know yes. I hope so well well and yes and unfortunately for the Church of England it's got He's got to have legislation that changes that because they've managed yeah. to get themselves into a, what a double protection somehow yeah. to, uh, uh, as a buy um, yeah. for not having to do anything, of, you know, about us. Um, I used to say, because um, I live in ross on wye and I used to say to people, do you think it's okay if I nip over to Wales and grab myself a few slaves? Because they're, <laughs> they're supposed to be from another country. It's okay if they're from another country. It's according to Leviticus, and people looked at me and said, "Well, no, of course it's not." <laughs> so why treat gay people like you do? And we're in the same, you know, same book in in the in the Bible. Ah, yes. Anyway, good. Thank you. But thanks. I'd love to. Yes, I'd love to um, continue that conversation and see if we can uh, make some make some changes there. That's really great. Thank you very much. Um, 
Peter, we got the questions. Come yeah, um, yeah. I, I just want to say that on, on the religious side, I think the problem is that very often that people don't understand that you can be a good Muslim or be a good Christian or be a good Catholic, uh, and and uh, you have a perfect right to be in your faith community, and certain texts that are used. Uh, are used to uh, undermine and uh, and make life very difficult and almost impossible uh, for people in the LGBT community. But mm -hmm. the thing about an inclusive church or in a place where teaching is given, which is in a in in, in a in a way that's responsible, then the, the the welcome is there. And I think it's it's really important not just to say, well. Uh, there is just one line because of Leviticus or because of something else that's in the Quran mm. or something mm. like that. It's uh, People choose to take passages in certain ways. And, and I think there's a more enlightened way of seeing things. Mm. These mm. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yes, I agree. I, I'm, yes, it's easy to cherry pick your way through the bits that suit you, whichever side of the, you, you're on, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Thank you. There's lots of comments coming out about this, so it's lovely. Um, Maggie's just raised it again. Um, jo um, put a question in the chat earlier, and um, she sends her apologies to having a few Wi-Fi issues, but she's asked, um, she thinks she might have misheard, but you said something about a translator commenting on or judging what was being said by an asylum seeker. Does this still happen, and do you know what steps are being taken to guard against this? Um. I, I've not come across it since, um, and I we only found it because we actually managed to get a um, not only the transcript but the um, the recording of the interview that this person had, and it's quite a few years ago now. Um, and I got somebody else who who understood um, Farsi, is it Iranian Farsi? um and they they listened to it and said well this is uh this is you know um this is wrong this guy had interjected with this comment um to the asylum seeker um but i i don't i haven't come across it since uh, but i i don't know um it's the sort of thing that put would put somebody off saying anything after that, isn't it, really? Because uh, you don't know whether how your, um, you know, what you're saying is being interpreted or misinterpreted or what. I'd hope it's not. I, I know, I know. Our the solicitor at the time made a fuss about it as well. We used it um, in his case, so um, I, I guess it probably got back to the home office. I'd like to think so, hopefully it got addressed. Yeah, um, yeah. Unfortunately, we are going to have to draw things to a bit of a close. Um, but if you do have any other questions, um, I'm sure we can try and circulate for you. Um, thank you all so much for coming. This has been a really, really fantastic session. Um, and it's really great to hear from you, Ian. and thank you for coming along. Um, it's, it's been really insightful. Um, and yeah. as always, any other questions or ways that we can help you, please let us know and we'd be happy to reach out to you. And it'd be a really great experience. So thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And I'll pass to Isabel just to close the session. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to say thank you as well. And because uh, Ian won't say it, please do donate to Gay Gloss. That's definitely a way you can support his work. Um, you can find them online. Um, and we've all, I think, understood and seen what great work Ian does alongside the other volunteers. And so thank you for giving up your time today, Ian. And um, all the best for your work in the future. You're very welcome. Thank you. And uh, thanks for all those uh really good questions as well and if if you've got more questions and you want to field them to me via isabel that's fine um you can visit our website and you can probably send me an email as well if you wanted to do it that way as well. thank you very much thank you